are, are these cities planned or do they happen? And you'll forgive me, I'm on your turf, so you know, I, I think my examples are appropriate. But I would describe planned cities as uh, Barcelona, which transformed uh, through the, it was the Olympics, I think, that was the, the source of their transformation. Singapore, where you can go and stand in a room this size and see uh, a model of the city, and they're going to build there, and that's what they're going to do next. I would describe those as sort of planned success. Um, or do they happen? Uh, this ground feels shakier for me, but cities that I think are smart but have happened might include uh, Tallinn in Estonia um, uh, and Kigali. But, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they may not be the best examples, but... Look, I'm, I'm trained as a planner, so I kind of have to say we need some planning. No, no, you, um, <laughs> you don't. You don't. I'm, I'm an economist. We need fewer, not more. <laughs> yeah. um, look, I, I think we need planning, but planning can, can and has been quite problematic in many different ways. I think we've got to face the reality, and if you look at the UN Habitat figures, for most African cities, the unplanned parts of the city, the footprint of the unplanned part, has outpaced the planned part. So we largely in Africa... Almost all cities have unplanned cities, if you want to look at the relative footprint. Mm. And South Africa is falling very much into that category um, as well. Um, now, what does that mean? Does that mean it's hopeless? No, I think, I mean, and Kigali in a way is a good example, but, you know, that's kind of what you can do if you don't have to worry too much about being democratic and all of that kind of stuff. You yeah. can just decree <laughs> what you think ought to happen, and, and maybe we need a bit more of that. Uh, but I think it also has to be contextual. I think it does have to be dealing with a mess and the resource that you do have. Uh, and so I do think that retrofitting cities is something we have to be thinking about. I think that's the kind of language we need to be having, not this idea of new cities that you run away to and that we're going to escape the mess of the core and, and, and make something better elsewhere. That doesn't work, and I think it's a very dangerous market-driven logic that's taken a grip of many African countries and cities. Uh, I think it's not helpful. Uh, and I think there's a lot to be made and there's a lot more to be gained by focusing on the core of what we got through some planning, but probably planning that's a bit on the back foot because a lot's already happened. If, uh, yeah, if, I, if I can just add to that, I think that it's, um, it's, it's, you know, if you have to talk about this binary about between a planned city and an unplanned city and which yields greater benefits in terms of mm. being smart, uh, I, I don't think it's an either or because each could create its own mayhem. Um, and I think that... Uh, Rather talking about a, a, a style, or and I think we should be talking about a, an approach to it, because I, if I see planning with empathy, uh, planning that is um, sensitive and has um, has an agenda, a, a, a political, social agenda, I find that it could come in. If it is inclusive, if it has interesting participatory participatory models to it. I think that becomes a really empathetic plan that understands the nuances of it and can and can um, set its own standards about what it's looking to do. I've also seen uh, settlements that have grown up from complete chaos uh, uh, with great social upheaval, uh, finding its feet and saying that it's, it's through our mess uh, or great crises, traumas, that we're able to find our feet. So that trauma has been really productive in letting a, a, a neighborhood find its feet. So it's, it's a it all, it, I think it just takes some really interesting leadership uh, to take it forward. And, and so agency. Could you give us, um, in closing, examples of either cities or neighborhoods that have done spectacular transformation? Um, you know, what that transformation uh, uh, looks like in terms of substance, that they were this, they're now this, and what the magic ingredient was? There's a... Uh, three years ago, we, we undertook some research in, um, in Katatura, in, in Vintuk. And the Namibian planning is very similar I'm to... I'm glad you told me where that was. I was like, yeah, yeah. Okay, wow. that's it. In Katatura, in, in Vintuk, Namibia. And uh, it, it intrigued us because Helen Zilla made a comment about how bad 
uh, how, how bad alcohol is for high streets. And it does have some social ills to it. And because she said it, we were interested to go and see exactly what <laughs> Zilla said. So we went into uh, Katatura to find that in a two-kilometer street, there was um, 66 taverns on that street, which is, which is, which is, which is an incredibly high density of, of taverns. Wow. And, it, com <laughs> and it, comes with, it comes with its, it, with its very specific ills around it. Uh, but uh, being urban scholars like Geshe and myself, we are curious about why this phenomenon takes place. And uh, what we found was that because of the Germans in the neighborhood there, in, not in the neighborhood, it's in, the, in, in Vintuk, they quantify the data. So we had lots of data to look at. We went back five years later. And the one thing that the Namibian government did is that they did something very different to what South African government does. It's, it's basically said that even though your property is not zoned for business, we will encourage businesses if it takes place along these corridors. So it didn't criminalize a business activity not like we have here. And what that's done, as soon as you put, you legalize the ability to make a business, irrespective of my zoning, you found more taverns come up, right? But it calmed down after a while because um, it, 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 it brought greater economic diversification. So previously we found 66 taverns and about 20 other businesses. Now we find 88 taverns, hmm. but about 300 other businesses on that space. So what you're finding is that it, it's kind of counterintuitive about how yeah. alcohol plays a role, or you've not, I wouldn't say alcohol specifically, but you'll say, <laughs> I, because I've been misquoted on this a few times. But I, I do think you've got you to think about what are some of the more disruptive businesses yeah. that has a disproportionate effect on, on a street. Now, the, just to draw your attention about why that is different. If you take a, a walk in any South African township, and you go and find a tavern. The tavern doesn't present itself on the high streets. It's something that is in the back door through a passage at the back end of the neighborhood. And it it's, takes on a, a, a darker formation. Whereas the taverns in Namibia all wanted to be part of the high street. And what that means, it takes a, um, a tough uh, business type and brings it into the public domain and it becomes a little bit more mature mature by having food, uh, offerings to sit down, television, and more amenity for the user. Uh, so that's, that's an, an example of how something became smart, because it's able to adapt and, and move along, and all government did was say, we're not going to criminalize you. And it didn't take a lot, hmm. but that's it. Lovely example. Thank you. Keshi? Oh, I don't know if I have anything that good. Um, I'm gonna <laughs> try, <laughs> I'm try. I'm going to give two small ones that are a bit different. So the one is, um, so Mombasa in Kenya I find quite interesting because it's been a messy city for a long time as many coastal cities. I mean, Durban's not quite as messy as Mombasa. Mm. But um, a, a, a few years ago, um, the I don't know if they call him now the governor or the mayor or what they call him, decided that they had to do something. A lot of it is about also just the look of a city and coastal cities obviously because they struggle with salt water and its impact on buildings can look really ugly and messy in spite of beautiful buildings but they can just really look bad and he came up with this rule that everybody had to paint their buildings all the facades had to be mm -hmm, white cool. and blue because i guess they wanted to look like this mediterranean city that was cleaner than what it looked like and everybody went about doing this i think at great cost and and parts of it looked good but it was really a weird thing to do however what that's evolved to in the next administration is, I think, a decision that actually how the city looks and feels for people who experience it and live in it is important. And they're now going down a sort of a smart city drive, but a much, I think, more intelligent one than I've seen in other places because uh, it's, first of all, being driven by a lot of um, focus on the data. Uh, on inviting a whole range of scholars. So I know Wits University here is involved actually in Smart City Mombasa. They've got some kind of oceanic bodies that are focused on coastal economies and what that means for how they think about their city. So it's gone from being a cosmetic intervention that I think was probably quite foolhardy into something that's saying, but let's go deeper into what it is we can do here. And I don't think we can see the results yet, but I think we're gonna see special things happen in Mombasa. Uh, and, and maybe it took the dumb idea in the first place to start evolving into something that's a, a bit more s substantive. The second one I'd like to mention is maybe a small city, but I've watched because I have family there for a long time, but is Khabarone. Okay. So our neighbor here, Bots, in a very small city, you can't compare it to a Joburg, but what I like there is something that's got to do with a positive legacy, in my view. So uh, for those of you who know Gabs, for a long time, you know, they've had mixed income, something we've really struggled to do in South Africa, and that was a decision. That was a decision that you couldn't have concentrations of the rich living together, and then the poor live there, and then the middle class live there. So had, they had this mix of lots that were considered to be high income, middle income, low income, 
houses, but they were not distinguished spatially. So they were all mixed up. And in fact, they would have ratios where there are too many high income here. So if you want to buy, you can only buy middle income. Uh, and so they had that mix. Now, more recently, I mean, you do have some of the Gulf estates and that coming up and a lot of South Africans moving over, I think, and taking some of our tendencies there. So you are beginning to get some enclaves that are a bit more high income. But by and large, the city in terms of most of the residences are very mixed income. Uh, and I think that's something we could really learn from. And that's, I think, got to to do with a positive historic decision and legacy that can really play forward, I think, in very healthy ways. Uh, because I think there's a lot of potential that just comes from that, from not separating people and allowing so, you know, socially people to mix. But I think also in terms of creativity and what you imagine to be problems and solutions probably change based on who you're having to rub shoulders with. Your, um, your story of uh, Mombasa reminds me of uh, Valparaiso. Uh, in Chile, where I was at the end of last year, and this was, became an abandoned, uh, 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 it, it was a ghost town, a, a shipping town. Um, and uh, after moving into this ghost status, uh, it became uh, what is today one of the most painted cities in the world, uh, with uh, a city that's just covered um, uh, with uh, graffiti, but, you know, not uh, slanderous graffiti or crass graffiti, these beautiful murals, and it has transformed into one of the uh, most visited cities uh, in Chile from being a ghost city 20 years ago. Um, your, I think the reference, uh, you know, if I gather up what you guys are pointing to, I'm going to twist your words and suggest that you don't want your city to just be smart. You want it to be intelligent. Um, and the examples that you've given us uh, and the tools uh, that you've pointed to really put substance on this rather sort of vague notion of what it means to be uh, a smart city. So thank you.